I'm really excited for this next segment. So uh, with me, um, I have some longtime friends, uh, and you can see on the screen, we have Jay McBain and we have Michelle McBain, and I'm going to let both of them introduce themselves in just a moment. But before we do that, uh, this is all about channel leadership, your voice and the impact that you can have in the industry. And it doesn't matter if you're a vendor, if you are an MSP, if you're wanting to communicate with your clients or just in our channel, everybody at one time or another wants their voice heard. And we're going to give you some fantastic tips today. So to, to kick us off first, Michelle, why don't you, uh, you know, of course, Cisco and Global Lead for MSPs and XAAS, but you do a better job and, and take just a second and, and share about yourself. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. It's a pleasure to be here with you today with, with my blushing groom. I'm delighted to have this opportunity. And uh, my name, of course, is Michelle Ragusa McBain. I am the global lead and channel evangelist for Cisco's managed service providers and everything as a service. Um, it has been a huge driver for Cisco, especially um, expedited during the global pandemic. Um, and we really realize that the essential workers and the heart of the partner ecosystem is our managed service providers. So it's my goal. Uh, and it's sort of a, a unique opportunity for me because I began my career at Cisco. I was there for 13 years. I left for a few years and immersed myself in the MSP community. And now I get to marry these two roles together to help elevate the success of our MSPs around the world. So thrilled to be here and thrilled to help you guys succeed however I can. Fantastic. And of course, Jay McBain, Forrester. And uh, Jay, please do the same uh, kind of uh, give an intro on yourself as well. Yeah, absolutely. How often do you get to be in a session with your uh, spouse? So this is, uh, this is fantastic. Uh, so I've been in the channel 27 years. I led channels for IBM and Lenovo. Spent a little bit of time at Autotask, uh, went and did a channel software startup for seven years. And now I get to wake up every day and analyze the channel from every which direction, including the topic today at hand. So with Forrester. So excited to be here and uh, ready to get going. Awesome. You know, so I'm going to start off with a little bit of a statement. And that is, for, for starters, it's awesome to have both of you. And you approach... Uh, getting your voice out in such, I'm going to say, different creative ways. And part of it is your personalities. Part of it is, um, uh, I like to say, male-female um, attributes. But, uh, but no doubt, both of you are super connectors. So I can't think of anybody better to give some tips to the audience than the two of you. And, and let's just dive right in. And, uh, you know, I thought we'd kick it off by uh, chatting just for a moment about presenting, talking, talking up on stage. Sometimes people wonder, how do you get to be the person up on stage that people are listening to? And it's, it's really fascinating because it's not always because somebody called you. Sometimes people simply put the word out that I'm available and I have content to share. So I thought maybe a way to break the ice a little bit is um, if you could share, and, and Jay, you know, we're, we're looking at you so you can start. Is it always because you approach someone or someone approaches you, or is it a little bit of a combination? And how does somebody let, you know, voices know that, that they have a message to deliver that, that would resonate? Yeah, it's a little bit of a combination. Uh, so we have a lot of great thought leaders uh, in our industry. Um, there, it takes a little bit of self-promotion, uh, but the thing that a lot of people miss is at some point you've got to get your thought leadership down on paper or digital paper, as it were. You know, there's a lot of people on social groups that, uh, you know, chat up and, you know, go deep into subjects and things like that. But unless you have a home base that uh, you pontificate and you, you look at things, especially, you know, what's happening this week, this month in the channel and, and put your own spin on it. Um, you don't really have a base that you can actually go out and say, you know, here's some content, here's some original, fresh thinking to motivate whoever is running the event. There's 150 different events in our industry, and it's got to be something that's um, interesting to the audience and perhaps a little unique to the audience as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and Michelle, same thing. Um, do you find that most of the time you're reaching out, letting everyone know that, that you have a, a message that you can share? Or do you think uh, almost all the time they're reaching out to you? Um, so I would agree with Jay. And I would say that Jay and I uniquely live by three words, which is be visible every day. And the concept is it doesn't matter the platform. Um, if you're typically doing keynotes or breakout sessions or webinars such as this, you always want to raise your hand. You always want to say yes to an opportunity which is presented to you. And you always want to um, allow yourself the ability to build your digital brand, which will get you noticed enough to be asked to come on stage and speak. So for those people out there who say, you know, I don't speak, and I always find it so amazing to me because they say the biggest fear in life is public speaking. People would rather be dead in the casket than giving the eulogy at the funeral. So the second biggest fear is death. So it's ironic because that is a unique opportunity which allows you to share your thought leadership, your insight to Jay's points. And you have to have, um, obviously, content. Um, but the way you deliver the message, the why, uh, Jay and I often talk about people do not remember how you make them feel but or what you say but rather how you make them feel so is the delivery one that allows them to resonate to captivate to engage to make them laugh to entertain whatever your way of delivery is very critical in terms of being a good public speaker but you have to do a lot of it and it takes hours of practice and repetition so if you've never done it you want to start by raising your hand even in local communities and local chapters and in your own internal organizations and you want to start delivering a message and you craft that message and you hone it in such a way that allows you to be able to get uh, additional mind share in the ecosystem to say, you know, that's a great topic. And once somebody sees you present it, oftentimes they'll ask you to come and present to their community as well. And it just becomes a grassroots effort in that regard. And, you know, I think it's worth adding, too, that I've seen both of you either do, be the main presenter, I've seen you moderate, and I've seen you be part of a panel. So my point is, based on where people's comfort level are, there's different ways that you can engage and still be the voice that people are listening to. And, and you can be that voice, you know, again, to this channel or to your clients. And, and uh, Jay, as, as uh, we kind of leave this little piece, uh, I want you, uh, you and I have talked about title abstract before, and you always have great titles. So give a little tip on, on uh, naming your session, like putting a title to it that is, and why that might be important. Yeah, absolutely. And just to you know, finish off on the last topic, I was given a great piece of advice kind of in my early twenties, just starting my career. And the piece of advice was on speaking get over yourself. Number one, people will not remember you. Number two, people will not remember the things you said. And number three, people will not remember the things you showed them. So for everyone that's laboring over every little punctuation mark on every PowerPoint slide, no one's going to remember. If, if you're laboring over you know, the proper sentence structure, nobody's going to remember. As Michelle said, it's how you make people feel. And so in the end, a home run of a session, keynote, breakout, moderation, whatever it is, a home run is if a week later, somebody in the audience remembers the way you made them feel and maybe link that back to some advice or recommendations. So that get over yourself kind of drove me to the, you know, sometimes people will say, just imagine everyone's you know, wearing underwear and things like that. That's kind of the wrong way to think about it. And it's just this idea that, it's the passion, it's the energy, it's the excitement, it's all feeling. And it's something I don't do well, but in terms of speaking, that helped guide me in terms of uh, you know, where we go from there. The title and abstract, which in many cases, as you do more and more of these, you get better. Uh, one thing I learned when I did my startup and ran marketing is that the titles we use, you know, clickbait titles on social media and clickbait titles that we see in Gawker and, and, and these different websites, they go back over a hundred years. They predate the internet by a century. And there's this old New York Times, I think article about the seven types of titles and then the subtypes inside those. And those have just been rehashed 
over and over and over again. And they're the same today. You can either shock somebody, you can state a number, you can ask a question, you can go look it up. There's only seven types of titles. And then underneath that, you architect the title, which is the clickbait. It's the, I have to go to that session. The abstract is, you know, dropping a little statistic, dropping something that's shocking and let's unpack it and let's go frame it up around the future. You know, nobody wants to go listen to uh, anything in the rear view mirror. Everyone wants to go listen to something, what's happening in the next 12 to 18 months. How do we come out of COVID in whatever location we're in? What are the top spending areas? What are the big predictions and trends? These are the types of things that trigger people to say, hey, I can align myself to the future. I can think of where the puck is going to be to use a Canadian quote. And that's the, t that's the key with titles and abstracts is, is just make it that interesting and always think about this A-B testing on, on what's gonna win from that clickbait title. Can I just piggyback on there real quick, Dave? Because I have absolutely. One yeah, thank you. So there's an expression that I heard once, um, and I know we've all heard "fake it till you make it," and I don't really like that because it owns that you're not being true or authentic. And I'm always a big believer in being authentic and genuine. But I heard one that's called "own it till you own it," and the idea is that you are going to own this concept, this brand, this title, and you're going to repeat it in a number of ways that allows you to become the expert and thought leader. Right? Everybody learns something different at a different age or stage. In their career, including public speaking. And so it's one of those things that allows you the opportunity. If you uniquely position your why for a Simon Sinek reference, what is your why? If you look at products and, and price points and your competitors, many people are talking about similar things right now, hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, the future of work, cybersecurity. What differentiates you, your products, your services, what is something to Jay's point that's clickbaitish enough that intrigues me? Time is valuable. Do I want to spend an hour listening to this particular session or this particular webinar or topic? So you have to get me in the door, in the room, in the virtual lobby, and then you have to keep me there. And I think that's the best um, advice that I can give anyone who wants to become uh, a brand recognized leader in the industry is to really understand your audience, understand what's important to them, and understand how you can solve and position your products or solutions. And I don't think everything should be a, pro a product pitch. Now, some people are like to go in the speeds and feeds and in the weeds, but not everybody does. So you need to know your audience and you need to elevate your conversation to captivate them in a way that will keep them educated and um, entertained. That would be yeah, my best absolutely. Advice. You know, both of you are fantastic curators of content. I mean, you, you generate terrific content, but most of the time you deliver that content on a platform, i.e. like a social platform. And that's how you get the word out of what you've created. So let's kind of shift a little bit and talk about social platforms. So the thing that I think we all love about it, number one, um, the barrier to entry meaning it's so easy to engage in social platforms, especially in today's age. The budget, well, you can't beat it. I mean, the budget to, to get there. But then the key becomes, um, how do you leverage it? What tips, tricks, how do you make it successful? So let's kind of transition and, and, and Michelle, you're kind of in my view here. So I'll let you kick it off and, and share some of the, the techniques that you have found to be successful when you're leveraging social media to get that message out, to engage with everybody? Yeah, great. Uh, it's a great question. And there's uh, numerous answers for that, right? Everybody has their own preference. If you had a lineup and you said, well, how many people here like Facebook? How many people like going, attending webinars? How many people like LinkedIn? How many people, you know, are on there just being a voyeur or a lazy liker or actively producing thought leadership? Um, you're going to have Reddit interest. You're going to have Clubhouse and podcasts. And there's a diverse spectrum of people that have disparate interests. So again, you want to be visible and omnipresent in all of those particular channels. Now, some people would say, if you're a small MSP, you wear a lot of hats, you may not have the 
time, the bandwidth to be everywhere. So maybe you want to start with one or two platforms that are most relevant and opportunistic for you in your goals. And I would always suggest LinkedIn as your primary because that has 725 million business professionals all have problems that need solving. None of them want to be sold to. So you don't want to lead by pitching, but you want to add value. And so there's the LinkedIn SSI score. I highly recommend everybody take it if you have not. www.linkedin.com forward slash sales forward slash forward slash SSI for social selling index. In that score, you're going to get four components. And really these components make up anything that you'll do in life. They will make up your brand. What is your brand? And personally, I think your brand should be the same on the golf course, in that hotel lobby bar after the conference, in the meeting. Your persona should reflect professional and personal elements of who you are because people buy from people they like. Your second component is going to be who you're connected with. If all you connect with is your partners and people you work with, they're not gonna buy from you. So that's really not your best audience to capture and captivate. So, you know, when you get those bunch of fishbowl cards at an event or you have business meetings, I would like everybody to go out and connect with everybody that they've worked with, past, present, or future, who they want to work with. You have to build a Rolodex virtually of who is important to you in your in your networking. The third component of that is really engaging with insights, and that's the content that you share. So there's a really interesting statistic by IDC that said 75% of B2Bs, 85% of C-level executives and vice presidents look for content before they even talk to a salesperson. They look for up to five pieces of content. Are you sharing what they're looking for? White papers, brochures, ebooks, infographics, blogs, analyst reports from Forrester, my favorite. Those are the things that your you know, customers are looking for and seeking, and you need to either create it in-house or co-brand it with vendors to help you be successful. And then your fourth component that's really important is your relationship building. And that's the most important thing for anybody, right? And that's for LinkedIn, but that's for any social platform. So you need to create content, you need to share content, and you also need to go fish where the fish are. Don't just post it on your wall hoping people magically come. Go to the LinkedIn groups, go to the Facebook groups, go to the communities where your clients and prospects are if you really want to be successful. Absolutely. Jay, you got to squeeze in here, I tease. You got to squeeze in here and and share likewise uh, how you how you view and leverage the the platforms to get your voice out. Yeah, you can tell Michelle teaches the biggest companies on the planet on, on how to do this. Uh, some great advice. I take more of an analytical approach. I just recently published the 141 social groups across the platform she mentioned: LinkedIn and Facebook, obviously Clubhouse and Reddit and Discord. There's obviously Slack channel. So there's about 15 different social platforms that, that I looked at, but I get really interested in the algorithm. And if I were to take something away from this, and I think we kind of know this, but when you dig into, for example, the way Facebook works, when you make a post, it's all up to the first hundred people. They will, they will offer it up onto a hundred different people's wall. And those first hundred people, which is somewhat random, their response to your post will dictate whether anyone else on the planet sees it. And so if you don't get likes and engagement and you know people spending time or clicks, all the different ways they measure, the whole platform is based on engagement. And obviously the more engagement, the more sticky it becomes, the more sticky it becomes. Obviously they're a trillion dollar company now uh, based on that advertising revenue from that model. Yep. But go back to those first hundred people. And this is gonna be family and friends and old, high school people and people in your hometown. And these are all the people that are going to be looking at this first. And they're really determined whether this is going to go anywhere. And LinkedIn and Twitter and everyone else kind of uses that same algorithm. And so if it doesn't catch fire, and that's why, you know, big things that happen in your life, you know, both positive and negative tend to get a lot of engagement because those first hundred people react. And then that's kind of when you go through these 141 different social groups, in, that the channel is involved in every day. Um, the people that are the most successful kind of understand that and work backwards. Yeah. And, and you know, this is, the, to me, this is so fascinating having both of you because 
both of you have a very unique way of, of approaching this, you know, both platforms as, as well as your audience. And, and I don't know how much of it is personality, how much is male, female. I'm sure it's a combination of both. But, uh, but Jay, uh, you first um, kind of share, you, you, you touched on it a little bit, meaning you, you talked about the analytics of it, but, but share how, how you kind of uh, just dive into that a little bit more on how you view when you look at social platforms and, and you're posting and you're sharing, um, why are the numbers important? Why do you look at those? Why do they intrigue you so? And what success do you see because you pay attention to those numbers? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, earlier on, you called me a super connector and that's more of Michelle, not me. If you go back to Malcolm Gladwell and the tipping point where the term super connector came from, there was also a maven and a salesperson. I, I like to think of a Venn diagram of all three of those things. And maybe I could be in the middle of all three, but I'm not a super connector. I just play one on TV. Uh, I'm not comfortable in the hotel lobby bar. I'm not comfortable in big audiences. Michelle will break into a thousand people in a room and you know introduce herself to everyone and, and get in the middle of the conversation. The fact is, is the maven sits a little bit behind the scenes. When I, when I moved to the United States about 11 years ago, I didn't know anyone. So the first thing I did is I went to all the sources I could to start figuring out who the movers and shakers were. You know, the US was 10 times the size of Canada. So there was no way that in my early, you know, 17 years of my career, I could go replicate that over the next 17 years. So the only way I could figure out how to do that faster was trying to figure out which another chapter in that same Malcolm Gladwell book is called The Law of a Few, the story of Paul Revere and why Paul was successful in 1776 and the two other people that rode off on that midnight run were not. This idea of the few people that really drive this industry. So I you know, got the 54 magazines, I got the 100 top podcasts, I publish all of these on my blog. I got all 141 social groups. I looked at all 150 events and I started ripping through every one of those websites. Every time there was a speaker, a sponsor, a board member, anything, I wrote it down. Here's the 24 associations. Here's who sits on the board. Here's who the magazines are writing about. Here's who's hosting the podcast. Here's who's keynote speaking at those events. And I just started scoring it. You know, you do a big event in Vegas and you're speaking and you're not paying to be on stage. Now that's worth eight points. If you do a small road show through St. Louis, it's worth two points. And over and over, I just based it on visibility. And I thought visibility would equal influence. And over the course of doing this, I got to 3,000 names that I had scored. I sorted it by the top 100. Back then, way back then, Larry Walsh was first on the list. When I did it five years ago, Rob Ray from Data was first on the list. So the, the, the list changes depending on the person's job, depending on the situation they're in and everything else. But the fact is, is the top 100 is the top 100. As they change jobs, they continue to drive the industry. And so this was a very analytical way of understanding the people that are the most visible and tend to show up in the most places. They're using social media, not as a singular platform, but as one of those ways to shout from the mountaintop and to make sure that they're driving value, that they're all boats are rising. They're not selling. And, and no one that's successful in this is out selling anything. They're community members. One of the you know, big HDG peer groups would call it go-giving. Mm -hmm. These are people that are helping others. And by helping others, you know, their businesses have succeeded as well. And that's the story of social media, along with other ways to be visible in this industry. Yeah, I, I I love the analytical side of that. And in a funny note, one of the, one of the among the many reasons I get along with you and Michelle so well is I have a little bit of your trait and a little bit of Michelle's trait, and I love the the analytics because I am more comfortable sitting at a table talking to one or two people than I am a group of people by by far. So I'm not a Michelle in that way at all. But uh, I remember you and I talking, one of the things I do is on LinkedIn, I take a look at the number of people that we have connections in common. Because when someone has 200 plus connections in common with me, I know they're running in the same pond, the same circle, the same industry that I am. 
and my interest and their interest are probably going to be, you know, on page together. And also when I post something, odds are it'll be relevant to them and relevant to their connectors. And uh, it's just a little part of, of that small sliver of the analytics that you do. But um, I love that angle. And, and Michelle, I want to jump over to you because you, um, you have such a, uh, I won't say, you know, totally different at all, but I'll say you definitely have a, a, a different side of how you approach social and the people interaction side and the way you tag people in groups. And maybe you can touch on that for a little bit. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, you mentioned earlier the, um, the energy between men and women and I, and I'll just call it diversity of thought really, because yep. I think that um, Jay mentioned he's more of an introvert. I'm more of an extrovert. I feed off the energy of people being around them during the global pandemic was actually Jay's happy space. So most people would think they see Jay keynoting two, three times a day that that's his comfort zone, but really it's not. It's sort of a forced effort in order to communicate. Um, and he finds his true happiness sort of being alone, decompressing and being more, you know, in pseudo intellectual. So we have different personalities, um, and, and I don't know if that's gender related or not, but I also do think that women in tech have a very strong relationship skills. We remember people's names, their families, their stories. And so that's one of the biggest benefits because I think whether you're in sales or marketing or anything, you are relationship building. That is the most important aspect of, of connecting with another individual or human being, and especially when you're having a business relationship with them, it's an extension. If you can choose between three different companies that have similar products, similar price points, I'm going to choose the person that I get along with, the person that I feel comfortable, that I trust as my trusted advisor. So there's a couple components of that to building your trust with your community, to building the relationships where you're a do-giver, as Jay said, where you don't um, have expectations. Sometimes you just offer things without wanting something reciprocally so. So so I think that there's a lot of opportunity in that regard to say, yes, I'll always say yes. I'll always raise my hand. I'll always be available if I can help you. Um, and Jay has that similar quality as well. And I think that has allowed us to foster people saying nice things and kind of propelling, hey, have you know so-and-so and extending that network. And for fun, we looked up our the three of our mutual connections and the three of us are at, at over a thousand of connections mutually with you. So I think that that is something to say, not only swimming in the same circles, but understanding who those people are and making that relevant conversation. So if I am making a post, I will know, for example, um, let's say it's a woman in technology post. I have chaired CompTIA's Advancing Women in Technology group. I recently joined the Alliance of Channel Women and I started our Southeast Florida chapter. Today was one of our first planning meetings now that we can meet in person again. And so we have these conversations where we are allowing ourselves to say, if I'm going to make a post about women in technology, I have a network of people that I would tag for something to that effect. If I'm making a post about managed service providers, then I would tag certain key influencers and friends. And I wouldn't do it with, you know, un unprovoked. I wouldn't do it if I didn't have a good relationship with those particular people. But I do it to um, bring attention to something that I want to share that I think they might find valuable or interesting or educational. And I welcome them to do it to me as well because it's almost sort of a bartering system of information and crowdsourcing. So there are a lot of different ways to communicate um, on the different social platforms, but that is one of the ways that I have found advantageous. Some people might try to exploit that purpose, knowing that you're an influencer or a super connector. And I don't think that that should be the intention. You don't want to exhaust the effort. You don't want to ta over tag a particular person or group of people, but you do want to let them know if they're, for example, a big tennis player and there is an interesting article about AI and tennis, then that you're thinking of them, you're acknowledging them, that you've listened to them. And so there's a different element to why you would tag somebody and including them in that conversation and advocacy to help promote or um, cheer each other's content on, I think is a valuable way to do it in moderation. Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. And, and you know, it, it's, you have to keep positive intentions in mind and you have to keep community in mind, meaning be doing it for the right purposes. 
and and right. you're obviously going to gain a lot more mileage. Um, let's talk uh, before you go on. Yeah. Can I can I add one thing? So yeah. I mentioned today the other day, and I wanted to share it with you as well that if you looked at that original list, and I I've been dating and married to Jay for about ten years now, so I have been around for first one and two versions of that list. And I said, I would challenge him that we should do this list again together for during the pandemic, who showed up? Because most of our community is road warriors. And if you are the type of person who is used to being in the airport, on planes, at you know, in the events, are you the type of person who showed up in a digital format? And I would say that you would find there were people that you wouldn't have thought were, um, great public speakers or champions for their solutions that really shined and won the day uh, and became influencers and super connectors in a very digital way during the pandemic who would not have shown up prior to this. So I am very curious to see how that scoring system would be impacted in what we'll call a new normal. I like it. I really do. And, and I think it's a worthwhile initiative. I really do. So I'm going to ask you something specific uh, about what we're talking about still. And that is, I've noticed when you do your post, first of all, you have to be happy as an example that LinkedIn went from like 1,000 to 3,000 in their length for a post, because sometimes you can get lengthy and I, I'm teasing, but it's also true and you know it. Whereas right. Jays, Jays have a tendency to be shorter and to the point. And uh, so here's my question for you, Michelle. I've noticed that you tag people you tag groups, you use hashtags. Mm -hmm. So my, my question is, which ones do you find more um, rewarding, more successful? Meaning to tag the people, the groups, the hashtags, or maybe the body of text that you've actually written when you try to balance those a little bit. Yeah, so that's a great question. So there's a couple growth hacks that I can give anyone who's really interested in learning uh, the, the algorithms, as Jay mentioned, right? So firstly, if you click read more on a LinkedIn post or any post that's kind of shortened, that gives it a little bit extra boost in LinkedIn. So I tend to write more because also that's my personality. I'm more loquacious. Jay's more brief. So brevity is more his style because that's his personality. I'm more descriptive. And so that's my style. It, it doesn't have as much to do with the content. As long as you can click to that read more, that's a benefit to the post. If people click on it, it, it bumps it up in your algorithm. The second component of that is the conversation that happens. So if people start engaging, talking, listening, um, liking, commenting, sharing, that, of course, is very advantageous for that post. And it's being very prescriptive in scoring and saying, okay, well, are, are people engaging? Are they interested in this? If so, I will expand the breadth, scope, and reach to a larger audience and a larger audience and a larger audience. And you cannot control what goes viral. It would be lying if I said that I had some magic formula for that. But it really is trial and error. It's the time of day that you post. It is the, um, the audience that engages with that post. And I'll give an example. I took a quick picture of Jay when he became Channel Influencer of the Year, holding an award with our two daughters. And their hair was a little messy. I hadn't brushed it yet. And I didn't anticipate the post would go viral, or maybe I would have did their hair a little better. But that post, because of the human element, which is something I'm going to say is very critical that people often mistake. LinkedIn is for professional posts only. Let me just be a voyeur and watch what happens. Let me be a lazy liker. And you wouldn't go to an event and just walk around saying like, 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 but people go online and they, they lose who they are. They lose their authenticity. They lose their engagement. So that post was not only a congratulation type of post, which LinkedIn really adores, but it also included elements of our family. And both Jay and I are very open about our life, our relationship, our children, our family. And so that post ended up getting over 40,000 views. So that is something that I can say. I have 15,000 connections, but there was so much 
admiration and liking and commenting and engaging on that particular post, it went viral. I could not predict that, but I can tell you if you introduce a little bit of your personality, a little bit of the human element, and always hashtags. There's no reason not to include a hashtag. And for those people wondering what is a hashtag, it's a metadata tag that allows your content to be found and allows you to find content. So for example, if you make a post about security, you can hashtag many different things, hashtag security, cybersecurity, cyber threat, risk assessment. There's many different words and components that would allow your content to go to hundreds, thousands, millions of people with just using a simple hashtag. So I would say you could have at least one to two lines of hashtags would help increase the visibility and viewership and the potential engagement of your post. And you want to post consistently. You don't want to just post, go away for a month. It's like going to the gym, doing a great workout. You run a 5K, you lift a couple weights, you drink a green goodness juice and you say, all right, now I'm fit. I have a six pack. It doesn't work that way in real life and it won't work that way on your social presence. You have to be consistent in your effort to achieve the goals that you want to receive. Great insights. And Jay, we got to jump over to you. One of the things, Jay, and, and, and you, can, you can answer in a, in a verbose way and share other things, but what I want to ask is you are fantastic for what I'm going to call um, off-platform content. So as an example, you might create the uh, top 150 influencers in the industry. And by the way, I'm, I'm so flattered and honored to be part of that list. So I'm just gonna do a well thing because, because I'm here. So I'm going to do that, thank you. But you post and then you make reference to off-platform content. And versus Michelle normally is within the platform. She's creating conversation within the platform. And uh, so, so maybe you can touch upon why you curate this content and then you come to the social platform and you share it. But to some degree, you're counting on people leaving the platform and reading your curated content so they can get educated and learn. And, and maybe you could just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I, I said earlier, and this is really important, uh, that you have to have a home base. And it may be a blog, it could be a podcast, it could be a clubhouse room. I mean, today you've got 30 choices of a, of a home base, but there's got to be somewhere that, um, that people can go. Uh, so I have a couple of blogs. One is owned by my company, Forrester. So everything I do in channel, and when I joined the company, I had to move all my channel stuff there because there's something that happened. I became the number one blogger at Forrester. We have thousands of analysts that write about all this great stuff like AI and automation and internet of things, stuff that's probably should be more interested than the channel, but it doesn't get the views. And what happened quickly at Forrester is I became the number one commercial analyst as well. And that's how people spend money. And that's how a public company like Forrester uh, talks to its investors. So this correlation between good blogging, good thought leadership, and good uh, chances to, you know, for big companies to spend money to capture more of that was, was directly made in that time. But on my personal side, I have jmcbain.com, which has been going forever since I've been, you know, 20 years old. And if I have a story to tell, my top 100 songs I listen to, because I measure them, or the cycling I'm doing around North America, family stories, love stories, everything goes on there and it becomes this story of, you can look at all the houses and places I've lived, the 72 cars I've been on, the thousands of miles that we've been on a boat up and down the East Coast, all of our travel to 85 countries, all of these are interesting stories in their own. And it gives a home base for that. And just you know, a little while ago, I updated the music because it was about five years since I did it. And my top 82 songs and the 600 other songs on my iPod at the time, have now become you know 744 songs that are all measured but on the channel side on the forester side i do the same thing why would i go and follow 54 magazines and keep it on a private spreadsheet i just kick out some html on that same spreadsheet and i cut and paste that into the blog and that becomes a list of the magazines then a list of the podcasts then a list of the events then a i have 14 different lists going and i do it for my job but i just make it all public 
-hmm. And it seems like you're giving away too much content for free. But as I just said, it commercializes because it's not the content. It's not the what, to go back to Michelle, it's the why, it's the how. Yep. And that's the value here is you've shared some really interesting thoughts, but how does that apply to me? What should I do next? Why should I care? To use a Dave Sobel quote, the, the fact of the matter is that's where the monetization of this is, whether it's for your MSP in your local region at your chamber of commerce, whether it's in your, your province or your state, this is how you make money, is converting your thought leadership into the what, the how, the why, and, and moving from there. Absolutely. Jay, I, I'm, I want, uh, for both of you, I want to jump off of the topic of social media and instead- just Oh, before you do. Yeah, before go. Before you do. Okay. Can I give you just one thought on that? Because this, you did mention that, and that is very important, but I keep it in-house, and there's a reason I do, because LinkedIn has recently started dinging you for taking you off-site. So I'll give you an example. If I record a 10-minute or less video on LinkedIn proper, I could get thousands of views. But if I try to redirect somebody to my YouTube it doesn't like that. It doesn't want me to get off their platform. So if, if you're a company and you're trying to go to your 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 um, blog site or to your YouTube channel or to something external within your firewall, LinkedIn will ding you for that. However, they have a lot of internal assets and tools that people, and I can say this because I talked to hundreds of MSPs and ISVs over the course of the last two years during the global pandemic, are not taking advantage of. And those include polls. So if you want to know what your audience is doing, ask them. Use a poll. Make it fun. Make it weekly. Ask them what their pain points are. Ask them what they read. Ask them who they follow. Ask them what events they're going to. Have a conversation, and then you can actually see exactly who answered it, and that could be a conversation starter for you. You can create events on the platform itself. And then you can invite whoever you want, publicly or privately. You can create articles on the site and you can redirect, like this article, click at jmcbain.forrester.com to read more. So you can house everything on LinkedIn specifically to get the eyeballs and visibility and then redirect them to a new platform. And that also goes for video. People like high-res photography, people love video. There's no reason that I would scroll through and not stop at something that was captivating or entertaining or moving because it's going to capture my attention and I'm going to stay and just listen. And if in the first couple of seconds or minute you can hold me there, then you have an audience. And I always tell people, how long would it take you to make 1,000 phone calls? How many people would you speak to? But if you can get to 1,000 or more people on your blogs, on your posts, on your videos, on your polls, through leveraging the LinkedIn platform itself, why wouldn't you? It's waiting for you. Absolutely. So let's transition on... on uh... Uh, non-social. So um, I remember when we first started chatting, I think you mentioned uh, something about we might see each other at IT Nation. Uh, there's a chance you might um, have a booth there. So a booth would be another example of something off of social. Now, um, maybe uh, just a couple things that you might think of that people could use to, to engage, uh, get their voice heard, um, besides social, besides the booth, maybe just uh, one or two things you can think of. Well, I actually am reminded of something that just happened. Okay, so I'm a big lover of philanthropy. I love giving back. It's one of my favorite parts of working for Cisco, and, and it always has been. They literally give you a week off to help give back time if you're interested in that. So everybody has something that's near and dear to their heart, a cause, something they're passionate about. So if you can engage on a level of philanthropy, that could be really beneficial. So for example, today in our ACW planning meeting, we said, what if we did something that was like, we go to Habitat for Humanity for the day and everybody can volunteer to help build a home for somebody in need, especially recently what happened in Miami. Um, lots of things are happening in the world around us with COVID, people losing their homes, et cetera. So we can certainly leverage opportunities to allow ourselves to give back our time. And then afterwards, 
have a little get together, have a little networking, have a little socialization. So taking things off of a business way and bringing it into a philanthrop philanthropic terms can be really advantageous. And the reason I this trigger for me was train our troops was actually at an event. And I was talking to their founder and CEO, and we were, had a great conversation how people started requesting that they would be all the way in the back of the showroom just so they could be by the train our troops tent because they had a dog who doesn't love the military who doesn't love animals who doesn't love a good entertaining show and so if you can find a way to pair doing good with the cause to connect with other humans and feel like you have something in common that could be a really interesting way to to give back to participate and to engage the other way that i think is really helpful is it's just a good old getting together and having a dinner or having a, you know, in the COVID world, you would say, let's do a virtual happy hour. I think people are a little fatigued from virtual happy hours, unfortunately. But if you could do it in a way that's entertaining, there's uh, things such as Drizzly that they'll send a cocktail set right to your house and you can have a mixologist and they can perform something that allows you to feel like you're at that hotel lobby bar with your friends, having a conversation and just checking in with your audience and seeing how they're doing. It's been a really challenging year for so many people around the world. And you want to ask them, you know, how are you doing? How can I help you? Those would be the biggest things that come to mind that are outside the scope of just giving a tchotchke away at a virtual booth or a conference. I mean, you can only have so many socks and golf balls, but if you can think of something original <laughs> or unique that can be really exciting and fun and friendly and get you talking and engaged. I think those are the great things. Just think outside of the box, right? Absolutely. Jay, first, let me give you a compliment and, and then uh, uh, share your thoughts. I remember uh, before you were at Forrester and I saw you at an event and the event, the, uh, the event's not important, but what I remember is this. I remember you did not have a booth there. Instead, Jay, you owned a table. Now, when I say owned a table, I, I'm being figurative about it, meaning you had a table that you were sitting at and you had reached out to, uh, I'm sure, a lot of people and you set up one-on-one -on -one meetings. And literally throughout the day, I saw person after person after person coming and sitting with you and you having meetings. And uh, so I'm not telling people don't get a booth. I'm simply saying, what another awesome strategy is to, you know, uh, be in touch with people before an event, uh, schedule these one-on-ones like you did and have those impactful conversations. And I thought that was a great example of something else that's so easy to do. And maybe you could elaborate or extend that to a few tips uh, off social, so to speak, and that, that almost anybody could implement. Yeah, this is definitely a book that you and I should write together, which is the event within the event. And most people don't get this. They'll go and spend twenty-five, fifty, hundred thousand dollars, get a nice big ten by ten booth, and you know, give away as many pairs of socks as they can. And with that, you know, proverbial fishbowl, you know, hoping to get leads, and then they wonder why, you know, each lead costs a hundred dollars and why they should never do events again. And then you watch a company like Datto, which you know, Rob Ray was traveling 312 days of the year. And now the company's worth $4.2 billion with a B. And, and you're trying to figure out like, what did Rob know that some other vendors didn't know? And this is probably why, you know, Forrester employs me is to tell 10,000 other vendors these stories. And when I ran a startup and we were focusing on vendors to sell to, the first 150 clients we got came from events. And it wasn't, we didn't have a booth at any one of those events. Um, and, you know, you may want to set up a small booth and then have somebody out in the hallway. But we started planning for that event three or four months beforehand. We looked at all the sponsors. We looked at all the speakers. We got a real lay of the land. We'd go to look at a big Vegas event, 250 sponsors. We'd run it through LinkedIn and, you know, cancel off any company that had less than 50 people that weren't kind of in our target group we'd be left with 75. Whoever went to that event would have 75 LinkedIn printouts with a person's picture and resume on it. And we would actually create 75 hallway chats, which seem random, you know, bump-ins, but they're actually prescribed 
and, and we knew what we were doing and which of those conversations we need to have to earn that point to have a follow-on call, make it a warm introduction. And it got to the point of measurement that you know, we'd sit down with our board of directors to the decimal point and talk about each event and how $1,000 in plane tickets and hotel fees would turn into a $36,000 recurring client, one per event on average. And then the question was like, how do you get to all 150 events? Because this seems pretty cool. It has a ceiling to it, yeah. but for a startup or a, you know, an MSP or something, this becomes interesting. So it was always this event within the event the pre-planning, the during the event execution from hallway chats to the hotel lobby bar, and then post-event follow-up. And that was the piece that most companies don't really dig into while they're spending $100,000 to throw a big party and buy a lot of uh, drinks during that event. Exactly right. Although exactly. I don't think that ever is a bad idea either. <laughs> <laughs> you see, but this is this is the part that I love. I, I love the diversity that exists right here. And and you know, um, we were almost uh, out of time and uh, uh, oh my gosh, I still have so much I, I want to hear and know. And uh, so so we're gonna do this. We didn't even touch upon how the two of you uh, positively fuel and feed off of each other's momentum. We didn't even get there. But so here's what we're gonna do. Um, for, for time's sake, uh, I want you to think about uh, tips that you can give someone that, you know, some people may look and go, but I'm nowhere near where they are. It's like watching, uh, um, uh, Michelle, you brought up tennis. It's like watching a tennis pro that's, that's you know, at Wimbledon and they're winning and, and they're at the top of their game and someone else says, I wanna get into tennis, but I'm nothing like they are. And uh, so I want you to think uh, about uh, what tips you would give someone that they could easily, quickly do that would help their voices be heard. And before you do that, um, I just want to say to everybody who's listening, thank you for everything inside of chat. We've been so busy sharing with you that we didn't mean to uh, discord, uh, stay away from chat. And uh, we'll, we'll obviously take a look at that and, and follow through on so many things that have been put there. The other one is, is remember the platform that the show is on today has video enabled so that means that uh, reach out, uh, click on Michelle, click on Jay, engage with them if you haven't already, engage with them and, and, and have a chat. I'm, I know that they would love to chat with you. That's what this is all about. So take advantage of that and uh, enjoy the social mixer. You get the idea, engage. It's all about engaging. So don't be shy, enable your video, and, uh, and I think Jay said it best, no one's going to remember necessarily what you look like or exactly what you said, but they're going to remember the impression that you left when you had a conversation with anyone in the platform or them. So engage. So that's my, my, my two cents there. So, so bouncing back, um, Michelle, I'll let you go first. Jay, I'll let you have the final word. So Michelle, Someone, maybe, maybe they're not brand new, but you, you get the idea. They're not sure where to spend their time. Their time is limited. What would you suggest that would help them up their game, help them get their voice heard? What should they do? Limited time, you get the idea. Sure. Yeah, I'll just start by uh, saying thank you on behalf of Jay. He never gets the final word at home, so he'll be delighted. <laughs> um, so... Uh, but in all seriousness, you know, there's that expression, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So a lot of people that I talk to in our community, they want to do these things. They're scared. They're trepidatious. They don't know where to begin. You just have to put one foot in front of the other. I have two small daughters and they walked, they crawled, they walked, they ran. So everybody doesn't start as a master of their craft. It takes hours of practice to be really good at what you do. 
And, you know, again, own it till you hone it. So just begin today. Start by posting three to five days a week on any particular platform. I would say LinkedIn. I love Facebook groups. They really rose up during the uh, pandemic. And I think that there's a lot of great communities within them and LinkedIn groups and other um, spaces. So find the places where you find either uh, peer groups where you can educate yourself and be inspired and where you can become the thought leader and share content and share information and listen and learn, right? Because it's a two-fold, uh, two-pronged approach. Now, when you do that, you really have to know what you need. And I think, you know, I mentioned some of those things, but do you have a, a presentation? Do you have a podcast? Do you have a blog? Start there as a company. Start creating content. You can hire somebody that we affectionately refer to in our household as cheap and cheerful. That's right out of college. That's looking for, for work. That's how I got my in at Cisco. That's how Jay began at IBM. You don't know what that person will look like if you give them an opportunity and you help them in their craft, they could be the best asset to ever hit your team. So make sure you give the right people with the right superpowers an opportunity to help you complement what you're not so good at. You don't have to be good at everything. You just might need to find the people who are to help you on that mission. And if you are the face of the company to every CEO out there, you need to be the face of the company. You need to be visible. You need to be um, explaining why somebody wants to work with you. What differentiates you from your competition? Why, why did you begin your corporation? And that goes through for everybody beneath you, your sales, your marketing. Everybody is an exemplification of your goals. And you need to work together um, within your company and within your community to really get the reach and the word out. So for me, it's just starting, putting one foot in front of the other, creating the content. And if you work with somebody like Cisco, I'm here to help. Like our team is really geared. That was my mission. I was brought on because we said, you know what, there's an opportunity that we're missing and we need to be better at helping our community really be successful and shine. So find your vendor partners that can help you on your journey because that's what they're there for. They have the content, they have the discretionary funds, they have the ability to help educate, train, certify, and provide you what you need to be successful. So lean in on that and work together to really elevate your success. Excellent. Jay. Mm -hmm. Same, same, uh, same thing. So, uh, you know, recommendations, what, uh, someone who maybe they're not just starting out, uh, but, but they, they're not really sure how to, how to up their game, how to, how to, how to gain momentum, how to break through the glass ceiling of wherever they are. And they're just trying to get to the next level up, but they're not really sure what, what might make a positive, impactful difference. What, what how would your answer? Yeah, I've got three, you know, kind of quick pieces of advice. One is if I ever lazy like one of Michelle's posts, uh, I end up sleeping on the couch. So comment, reshare, <laughs> do all the things you can. Uh, number two, uh, back to that comment about, you know, don't share off platform. They hate it. They do. Facebook doesn't want to send you to YouTube. It's owned by Google. Uh, LinkedIn doesn't want to send you over to somewhere else. So what you'll notice I do is I take a photograph or I take a picture of something and I share it and it tricks their algorithm into thinking I'm posting a picture and I share the link in the body. So it's a little bit of a different, little quick tactic, but that's a 10 X uh, multiple on the algorithm. Uh, don't just, you know, share a link from somewhere else. They're, they're going to push it to the bottom and nobody's going to see it. Then third, the most important piece of advice is get obsessed around your customer, what they read, what they listen to. There's 30 different ways to read and listen today. Get obsessed over that in your industry, in your geography, in your product area, in your segments you serve, the buyers you serve. Start asking a lot of questions. Start writing down all these things, double clicking on it. And then that leads you to the final part is who they follow, what they read, what they listen to, where they go, and then go and build your own list of top 100 people. We know today every company is becoming a tech company, every professional services company is becoming a tech company. When you're allowed to go to a customer again after the pandemic, 78% of people signing into the guest book are talking tech. Your ability to build your own ecosystem, your ability to go partner with those that are talking about tech, 
is your future, is being able to get that word of mouth, is not the word of mouth you've lived on for decades. It's the new digital word of mouth and building out this network of people that you're actually curating in between the events. And you're building these personal and professional relationships that are going to drive your business forward. Awesome stuff. Uh, you know, and, and I want to, uh, two things for starters, we could have easily gone two hours on this topic and, and there's just so much to, to share and give and, and offer. So, but for starters, uh, I want to thank both of you. I mean, it was awesome doing this, uh, with you together. And, and listening to the variety, meaning it, it's not like what, what uh, you know, Michelle said, Jay just said ditto and, and vice versa. Instead, as you, uh, you know, as, as I can see and everyone can see, there's such diversity just in the two of you on how you approach it, how you made it successful and how you continue to make it successful. And, and hopefully that gives everybody uh, insight and ideas on how you can make your voice more heard uh, by listening to the, the, the key differences and how they both leverage it in their own way. So there's not one set answer, but instead there's many ways that you can be successful uh, at it and getting your voice out there. So, so with that, we're really out of time. And, uh, and I want to thank both of you. Uh, awesome, awesome conversation, awesome knowledge, awesome sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for the opportunity.